Calling all volume seekers, ditch the products that just don't work. Living Proof's new technology delivers bigger hair that lasts. No teasing required. Use the code VOLUME at livingproof.com for a free travel size full dry volume blast with your $20 order. We are the science. You are the living proof. And by the Showtime original series, Masters of Sex. Join the swinging 70s with pioneer sex researchers, Dr. William Masters and Virginia Johnson. Masters of Sex, new episodes Sundays at 10 p.m. Download the Showtime app now and start your free trial. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. It's not easy being in love with a convicted felon. First, there's the separation. Then there are the reactions and gasps you get from family and friends when they ask, so what's he in for? Amy Friedman never expected to find herself answering such questions, but soon these questions, and many more, would shape her daily life. Tony Award-winning actor Cherry Jones, who you may have recently seen on the Amazon series Transparent, brings us Amy Friedman's essay, Kept Together by the Bars Between Us. When we met, he had already served seven years of a 13-years-to-life sentence for murder. He was once a drug dealer and had shot and killed another dealer on a miserable spring morning in a little northern Ontario town. I was working as a newspaper columnist and had become intrigued by the many prisons in Ontario and upstate New York. He was the chairman of the inmate committee, at the first prison I visited, and initially he was hostile, wary of my intentions. The fact that we ultimately fell in love always arouses gasps of disbelief, but there wasn't much to it. We fell in love the way people do, the same way I had fallen in love with other men. I understood he wouldn't be eligible even for day parole for another three years. And no, we didn't make love before we were married. Yet he and his daughters, who moved in with me when they were teenagers, quickly became the center of my life. A lot of people snickered behind my back about our marriage. After all, I came from a wealthy American suburb and was a graduate of a Seven Sisters school. He was slender and muscular, with blue eyes and a firm handshake. His hair once was blonde, and he thought it still was when we met, but by then, though he was only 38, it had turned silvery gray. He had grown up in a middle-class family. One sister was a doctor, another a businesswoman. His mother was wonderful. He was an athlete who took a wrong turn, a terrible turn. My closest friends and my mother and father, all of whom had visited him in prison, understood why I loved him. They knew his rich voice and infectious laugh. They spoke of how he lit up whenever he had visitors. Okay, so maybe I just like bringing warmth into a lonely man's life. And maybe the marriage was pure ego. But then, I always thought, every marriage is in some way. Oh, and yes, he had lines, the casually tossed off, I want my daughters to meet you. They need to meet an impressive woman. They're the kind of lines that work on women like me who like to think we are professional that we cannot be conned. Still, some people said it. Oh, man, Amy fell for a con. Why do you think they call them cons? And, God, could you ever... You know. But they never asked outright, did you ever make love? 
Yes, we did. Every three months, in a trailer, on the prison grounds, behind walls and gates, and under lock and key. Later I found out that guards could listen if they wanted to, because once one did, as he let me know when I was leaving after one more goodbye. I'd never talked with anyone the way I talked with him. I'd never had that kind of time. Nobody does. We talked for hours a day, often seven days a week, for nearly seven years, sharing water or coffee, feet sticking to the linoleum floors, backsides aching from hard chairs, eyes stinging from smoke, hands sweaty from clutching each other across the table, hearts fluttering, limbs aching to touch, listening to the loudspeaker, Friedman, come to the desk. I spent six New Year's days in prison visiting him, and this was year seven. I believed this would be the last, as his day parole hearing was in two months. Instead, I woke that morning cold, bitter cold, knowing something was wrong. The prison was several miles from the bungalow I bought one month before we married. I bought it because I wanted us to have a place of our own, a haven for him to come to one day, and a place of comfort for the girls and me. Lopsided, badly insulated, with yellow siding and a rickety roof, it sat on the lip of the St. Lawrence River, and from every window I could see the water and towering pines and open land. I heated the bungalow with a wood stove so that, in winter, the air always felt like a thick blanket, fragrant with oak and pine. That New Year's morning, I lay on the couch and stared out at the river through sliding glass doors. On this same spot, every night for all those years, I'd sat and waited for his call. I couldn't phone him. Prisoners have to call out, collect. Naturally, my bills were endless pages of collect calls. But I could never get enough of his voice, not even on those days when it was drenched with anger or suppressed fear. Everything about him turned my heart inside out. I sat on that couch and closed my eyes, trying to imagine what it would feel like when he finally came home, to sit with him, holding his hand, staring out at this river, to watch him cook his famous fish stew and serve it on real plates, to live our lives free of guards watching us and listening in on every conversation. That morning, I felt terror and aching. He hadn't phoned the night before. New Year's Eve and no call. The first night in nearly seven years he hadn't phoned, except for those times when the prison was locked down, when violence raged inside, sometimes for weeks. During those periods, there was no communication, just silence and fearful waiting. So I phoned the prison and asked the guard, anything wrong in there? Sometimes I felt sorry for those guards who sat in the same dismal rooms as we did but held nobody's hand. I also hated them because I knew what they thought of us. They wondered about women who loved convicts. They thought and sometimes told us that we were sluts, miserable garbage. They asked how we could dare to bring children into these places. And who were these children? Sometimes in my dreams I heard their voices, Friedman, feet on the floor, hands to yourself. The words they used to humiliate us in the visiting room. But that morning on the phone, I heard in the guard's voice only his own loneliness. Nothing going on in here. No lockdown? Everything's quiet. 
Well, is my husband in solitary then? I held my breath. Nope, he's fine, in a cell, or maybe the gym. But he didn't call last night. I knew never to say such things to guards, never to offer them ammunition. But I was weak-kneed, lost. Nothing I can do about that, he said smugly. I sat very still. The girls were away, and I was glad for that. I needed solitude. I rekindled the fire, wrapped a blanket around me, and waited. I waited through the day, watching the sky turn frosty and pale, then gray, then black. When the clock switched from 10 to 10.01, I knew the prison lights were out and he wouldn't call. I tried to cry, but the tears wouldn't come. Was he angry? Had I said or done something wrong? I thought about how much I needed him to come home, how I couldn't spend another year in visiting rooms, supporting everyone on my meager pay, dreaming of real life. Two days passed. I don't remember moving once, though I, I must have showered and eaten. I had been told how frightened prisoners can become when they face release. I'd heard of men who on the eve of parole commit crimes or suicide, how they suddenly fear the freedom they've craved for so long, how such fear can make them crazy or stupid. Finally, on January 3rd, he called. I heard the operator say, Collect, call. I screamed, yes, yes, I accept. And I remember the way his voice cracked, how he sounded even farther away than usual, out of my grasp altogether. Why? I asked. All night long on New Year's Eve, he explained, he had lain in his cell thinking about us, about what was ahead, how he couldn't do this. Saddle me with a husband who faced years of parole, who couldn't earn much money, who was a nobody, a burden. But I love you, I said. I've spent seven years fighting for you. Don't leave me, please. Give this a chance. I did talk him into letting me visit that day. We stood in that hideous room, and he held me with more passion and longing than I'd ever been held. We kissed, we smiled and wept. I gripped his hand and stared at him. Don't do this to us. Don't leave me, I said. And he didn't. Not that day. Not that month. Not for another 18 months. Not until after he had been paroled and after he had dived into a deep pool of depression and anger. Ironically, he tried to combat his depression by building walls. First a seawall of concrete blocks along the St. Lawrence. And then he kept going around the property, walling off as much as he could. But in the end, he couldn't keep him in. He did beat the odds and stayed outside. But when I remember the days and nights of sadness that followed the New Year's Eve he didn't call, I see only a sheet of snow outside the bungalow, and I feel the cold that pierced my heart. Because that was the morning I knew we were finished. I just pretended I didn't know. On the outside, together at last, we never had a chance.
Cherry Jones, reading Amy Friedman's story, Kept Together by the Bars Between Us. It's been 15 years since Amy and her ex divorced. We'll hear how she's moved on in a minute. Living Proof delivers bigger hair that lasts. Product tester Jamie explains what Full Dry Volume Blast does for her. What they tested a lot on my hair was kind of the next day result. So they were looking for how long did this volume really stay? Once you applied it, did it fall flat in a few hours? And it really doesn't. In fact, in my hair, I think it looks better 24 hours after. It just, the hair held amazingly well and it was ready to go. It looked incredible. Use the code VOLUME at livingproof.com for a free travel-size full-dry volume blast with your $20 order. We're back. It's Modern Love, the podcast. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. And now a postscript from the editor of Modern Love for The New York Times, Daniel Jones, and the author of this week's essay, Amy Friedman. Whenever I've told anybody I I was married to someone who was in prison, I think first after the initial shock, there's the sort of like, oh, but probably he was just a bank robber or something. And and then, you know, when people hear, oh, he was in for murder, um, there's that next piece of shock. In terms of how I dealt with the idea that I was married to someone who had killed someone, I, I think in some ways I didn't exactly deal with it, you know, um, there is no real acceptance except that it happened. And and if you're going to give people second chances, then you give them a second chance. I know for a fact that a lot of prison marriages do fail um, eventually. But I also realize, that, and this is very much in retrospect, that I fought so hard to get him out From the day we got married, for all of those six years, in some ways, I fought so hard that he didn't have to fight. And maybe, maybe, and this is a little uncomfortable to say, but it may be that he, when he got out, he wasn't just quite ready. The thing about getting out of prison is, you know, when you're inside, there's the dream. And the dream of what it's like outside never includes things like snow shoveling and never includes things like your wife looking not her most beautiful when she wakes up in the morning and doesn't include things like jobs and having to go grocery shopping. It just doesn't include all the the parts of life that aren't so much fun all the time. So um, he was pretty unhappy and... That unhappiness ended up being taken out on me. He was often angry and closed and um, emotionally unavailable. And so after seven years of marriage, I decided that we, we couldn't do it. And I asked him to leave. Amy's essay is such a strangely romantic story to me. Much of that, I think, is is the urgency um, and the impossibility and the sense of desperation and the sense of limited time. And it just heightens that bond or the sense of what, what's next and what are we going to make of this and how are we going to be together. And what's, what's so remarkably moving um, about how this story plays out is that when, when he does get out, that freedom sort of starves the relationship of its patterns and of its heightened emotions and of its of its romance, and I, I just thought that was um, was so moving and so well told, and kind of haunting at the end when he's spending his time building stone walls around their property. That idea that when you've been behind walls for so many years, that you need that, you know, or at least he, you need some sense of confinement to feel comfortable. I feel like there are two kinds of essays we run in Modern Love, if I could have two broad categories. And one is the, is the essay where you identify with the person and what they're going through. 
and it feels like you. You know, it feels like some version of you and something you've been through. The other is the kind of essay where you're really peeking into a life that's so different from yours and maybe something you've always wondered about where maybe some of the basic emotions are things you've been through, but the situation is so foreign to your experience that there is this sort of voyeurism and vicarious emotional um, experience. And Amy's story is that second category. Uh, So many people wonder and judge, how can that be? How can you fall in love with someone in prison? What's wrong with you? (laughs) You know, what... What is it that you're after? So ideally, that kind of piece that begins in voyeurism takes you to a place of understanding where you're no longer the voyeur. You're the person who could have gone through that experience. And I think that's what Amy's does for us. But Amy didn't write the piece with modern love in mind. She wrote it for a friend's book, and it was her friend who submitted it to the New York Times. Amy was concerned about what her ex-husband would think of the piece, so she asked his daughters, Sarah and Cass, not to tell their dad about it. He found out anyway. A few weeks after the piece ran, I get a phone call, and it's Sarah, and she says, Dad wants to talk to you. She hands the phone over, and I was pretty shocked. I hadn't talked to him in a long time, and he said an amazing thing to me. He said, I wanted to talk to you with Sarah here because I wanted you to know that I support this piece. Everybody has their own version of stories, and this might not be my version, but you always behaved with integrity. You were always a wonderful person, and and I wanted Sarah to know that I'm 100% behind you writing this story as your own truth. And Sarah got the phone back, and she went, wow. We both sort of just said, wow, We we were so stunned. A few years after that, Amy published a memoir about the whole experience with her ex, titled Desperado's Wife. The memoir angered Sarah, who hasn't spoken to Amy for three years. But Amy remains close to her ex's younger daughter, Cass, who now lives in Ohio and cares for Amy's elderly father. Cass is 100% supportive, and I I think she was younger. You know, I, I think one of the things that happens is children who have incarcerated family members suffer a lot and go through a lot of pain and a lot of shame and are stigmatized. And I think Sarah, because she was the eldest, really sort of took the brunt of that. And she just doesn't want to talk about prison. She doesn't want to think about it. She doesn't want to hear about it. Cass is much more open to um, looking back at the story and understanding it and all its complexity. Amy has since remarried and moved to Los Angeles. Despite the miles between Canada and California, Amy's experience with prisons remains a presence in her life. In 2013, she and her second husband started a nonprofit that helps students whose parents or loved ones are incarcerated. It's called Pops the Club. POPs stands for Pain of the Prison System. There are clubs in 11 high schools in California, Washington, Ohio, and Minnesota. I mean, the reason POPs matters so much to me is that I just want people to know and to be sensitive to those individuals who are very hidden from society, usually. And uh, it's really remarkable to me that this modern love piece has brought me to you to be able to talk about the work that I'm doing now. It just feels a little magical to me. Amy Friedman. She's author of Kept Together by the Bars Between Us and the memoir Desperado's Wife. She's also executive director of Pops the Club. We also heard from Modern Love editor Dan Jones, and earlier you heard the voice of actor Cherry Jones. We'll have more from Cherry after the break. Support for Modern Love comes from the Showtime critical hit series, Masters of Sex. Acclaimed sex researchers Dr. William Masters and Virginia Johnson are the pioneers of the sexual revolution, but can they keep up with the swinging 70s? Catch a revealing look at their controversial work, 
scandalous romance, and groundbreaking discoveries on Masters of Sex, starring Michael Sheen and Lizzie Kaplan. New episodes Sundays at 10 p.m. Download the Showtime app now and start your free trial. Tony Award-winning actor Cherry Jones lent us her voice this week, taking us deep into the complexities of Amy Friedman's love story. So we asked Cherry why she was drawn to this essay. Like so many people, I think, in our society, I've always had the prejudice of assuming that women who fall in love with prisoners are deeply damaged human beings. That's not a prejudice I'm proud of. But, of course, it's because I've never known, personally, anyone who's fallen in love with a prisoner. Amy's essay is the first time I've ever felt let in to a woman's heart and mind. And um, I thank her for this insight. And we thank Cherry Jones for reading this week's essay. She just wrapped production for The Party, a new film co-starring Emily Mortimer, Patricia Clarkson, and Kristen Scott Thomas. Look for it in 2017. Never miss an episode of Modern Love, the podcast. Subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Modern Love is a production of The New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, John Parati, and Amory Sievertson. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Our casting consultant is Amy Lippins, CSA. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for The New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. See you next week. If you've been obsessively following this election, you should check out a new podcast from our partners at The New York Times. It's called The Run-Up, and it features some of the best journalists at The New York Times to help make sense of this final stretch of the campaign. You can find new episodes every Tuesday and Friday on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts or at nytimes.com slash the runup. That's nytimes.com slash the runup. 